Good morning, Meadowbrook. It's great to see you all. Uh, some of you know that I was a soccer player back when I was growing up, and so I mentioned that just to say that I am not naturally like a running person. Like, I'm not like the person who goes out and just does long marathons. Now, I run because I have to run. Like, you had to run to play soccer. I, I really enjoy running, but it's not like my number one thing I do. It's probably ranked like number four or five on my list of ways to work out at this point. Like, I'll go for a run. It's fun, but it's one of those things where it's like, I'll run three miles or I'll run four miles. I'm not one of those people who's going to run like 10 or 15 or 20 miles in one go. So last year, I, was, I live up in Grafton, and there is this pathway that connects all of the cities. In fact, you can get from Milwaukee all the way up there, and you can keep going north. And so I just started running towards Port Washington one day, and I thought, I'll just run like three miles. That sounds pretty good. That's within what I usually do. And I got three miles, and I decided, you know what? I think I could probably do four. So I kept going, I got to four, I'm like, I'm feeling pretty good. Have you ever been there where you're like, your body's feeling better than you thought it would? And you're like, all right, I guess I will keep going. I'm going to do five, and I just kept going, and all of a sudden, I'm finding myself leaving one city and entering another one, and I'm almost to Lake Michigan. I'm almost like 11 or 12 miles in now at this point, and my legs are dying. I mean, like, they, they feel terrible. I had to call my wife. Like, there's no way I'm going to run another 12 miles to get home. Like, that was, I did not even think about it. And yet, I just kept going. Uh, it's a completely different style of running from my friend up here. We're going to show you a picture. Some of you might know him. He's an old Fort Wilderness friend. Uh, used to work uh, with him. His name is Abe. Abe is the kind of guy who will run, I'm not kidding here, 50 miles or more a day. He's kind of one of those elite athletes that you like never really meet someone like that until you do, and you're like, oh, oh, this person exists. He was the 15th person to run across the country solo, totally unassisted. Uh, he did it to raise supports for a hurricane back in 2010. So Abe is like the exact opposite kind of runner for me. Now, he grew up in Green Bay. And so on his way to Fort, what would happen is his dad would stop about 50 miles short of Fort Wilderness and just let him out the door. <laughs> and he would run the rest of the way. I'm not kidding. Like, we would go on short little runs up in the North Woods during the summer, and it was just sad because he's so fast, and he never stops running. And my legs get tired at about mile nine. I'm like, I'm done. I'm like dying at mile nine. And he just keeps on Going. So unlike myself, uh, Abe is this completely different kind of runner. Um, you know, running for me is more of like I do it to do other things. And for him, it's like a lifestyle. It's this daily conscious choice that he makes. Wait, wait, when he did that run across the country, there was so much planning that he had to do. I mean, he, there were so many steps that he had to take in order to do that kind of thing. Now, my guess is that you probably never will run across the country. I'm just going to guess that. Uh, but my guess is that you also probably have something in your life that you're focused on or aiming towards. Or maybe you find yourself in a time of life where you're just, honestly, life is more relaxing right now. That's okay, too. But you can probably remember a time in your life when you were, like, really aiming or focused on something, um, something like that your life centers around. And if you spend much time on social media, you'll know that there's countless people who they brand themselves to make it very clear what matters to them most, right? So here's a couple examples of uh, some people that I follow on, on social media. The first one is Rich Vilotis. He's just a pastor. These, a couple of plugs for people. Here you go. So these are people you can check out. But, so for him, you know, it's real simple. At the top of his page, it says he's a Brooklyn-born pastor. He's an author. He's a husband. You know, like those are the things that are most important to him. Here's another one, one of my favorite athletes in the world. Bukaya Saka, right? Athlete, Arsenal and England footballer. That's it. If you don't know what a footballer is, I will pray for you. <laughs> There's still time for you. Um, so, so that's real clear, right? You look at these like, pages of people on social media, and it's really refreshing to see people who have just this very clear, this is who I am. And, and that idea that we have in our world of turning ourselves into a brand, it can actually be kind of helpful in some ways, because it can help us focus not on 
all the things that matter to us, but on the one thing that matters most in our lives above all else. And when you're around people who have really like clarified this in their life, you know it. You know it because they're really clear in their language, right? You've probably been around people like this. Maybe you're a person like this. You're like, I know exactly who I am. They have this crystal clear image in their, in their minds about who they are. It's what they're up to in the world. They know what's important. They know what's not important. They know how to prepare for what's around the corner because they're clear on who they are and they're, what they're called to and where they're headed. But here's the deal that we can too easily forget, and it's actually an encouragement to you this morning. When you see somebody who has a really crystal clear focus like that, I just want to remind you of something. Nobody starts with that. There was a time when they did not have a crystal clear focus about what was most important in their life. You know, every single vision, even human-sized visions that we have for our lives, they, they require a great amount of planning. Like just like my friend Abe, I mean, he had to contact so many churches along the way and tell them, hey, I'm going to be running across America. Can I come and stay at your church? Can I sleep at your church? Can I get help along the way? He had to do all of this planning. I mean, even human-sized uh, visions for our lives, they require all this planning. But now think about it. Think about a God-sized vision for your life. I mean, a God-sized vision, you're, how are you going to feel at first when you get a vision for what God wants for you? You might feel totally in incapable of doing it. You, you can't accomplish what it is he's asking you to do. So here's the question. How do you do it? How do you do it? I wanted us to take a look at the dynamics at play in Paul's life that led him to say some very strange things at the end of the book of, or at the end of Colossians chapter 1. So go ahead and open up Colossians chapter 1. We're going to take a look at the, just the dynamics. Like, how did Paul get to a place where he said these things? We're going to start in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. You can follow along in your Bibles. Colossians 1, 24, he says this. He says, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. Okay, ears open, right? <laughs> now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now we're standing at kind of like a pivot point here in Colossians 1. He's been talking to the church. And now Paul's going to take a little break and talk about his own mission, the call that God has on his life. And so let's read this again. Let's reorient. I want you to hear this verse again. He says, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. I fill up in my body, in my flesh, what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Can we just name that this is not a normal way to talk to friends? Like if you were writing a letter to your friends, would you ever say this? Or, or imagine that you're on like a video chat with your friends and you're informing your friend that you're in jail and you say, hey, listen, I'm in jail. I'm suffering for you. And not only am I suffering, I'm suffering for everything that you've done and not only that, but I'm happy about it. I'm happy about it. Can you imagine saying something like that to a friend? Uh, that word rejoice in verse 24 can be translated rejoice, shockingly but it can also be translated thriving. Think, think of that word thriving. How often do you use that word like, oh, I'm just thriving right now? We don't use it that often, but, but it's like a strong word, right, to, to thrive. And Paul, could, he's sitting in a jail cell. He's like, I am just thriving, you guys. It sounds ridiculous. Uh, in fact, not only did Paul delight in his trials for the church, but he himself took on the mentality of Jesus. There's a very weird phrase here in this verse. I just want to tackle it before we go anywhere else. Because here's what he says. He says, And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. Isn't that weird? That's like one of those head-scratching things in the Bible. Now, at, at first time reading it, you, you, it sounds like Paul is saying that something about Christ's afflictions were lacking, doesn't it? But he just got done telling us that Christ's afflictions and his death reconciled us to God, causing us to be blameless. So I don't think that there, he's saying that there's something lacking in Christ's afflictions. So this helped me this week, actually, to break the verse down into a smaller portion. So just read it this way. Just read the first, the first half of it. He says, And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking. 
He's filling up in his flesh, flesh what is still lacking. The thing that is lacking here is actually his own participation in Christ's afflictions. Uh, in fact, if you rewind just one verse, if you go back in your Bible, just to verse 23, it was, it was from last week, he says this regarding the good news. He says, It has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So in verse 23, Paul has become Jesus' servant. And in verse 24, he's becoming a sufferer on behalf of Paul, or on behalf of Jesus, on be, uh, for the church. And so what is Paul doing? You recognize what he's doing? He's actually trying to emulate the way of Jesus in his own lifestyle. He is trying to emulate becoming like a suffering servant. You know how Jesus became a suffering servant for you? Paul is becoming a suffering servant on behalf of the church. That's what he's talking about here. And he's happy about it. He's kind of like unnaturally happy about it. Why? Well, have you ever seen um, a sports writer when they're like interviewing an athlete and, and, you, and they talk about this particular athlete? And whenever they want to talk about one that's like really, really hardworking, you know what they'll say? They'll say, well, she's the first one in in the morning and she's the last one to leave at the end of the day. Or, or he's the first one in in the morning in the weight room and he's the last one to leave. Like he's doing more than what was asked of him. And now, I'm, so I'm not here to tell you to just be like Paul in your thinking. I'm actually here to ask you to cause yourself, ask yourself, why is it that certain people get to a place in their commitment to something? Like, how did Paul get there? How did he get to that place where he was so committed to the church and to Jesus? Because in all honesty, us looking at what Paul is saying here and then trying to muscle our way to thinking the same way, there's a really good chance that's not going to work. Or it's going to take a really long time to get there. But asking why someone might speak and act with this kind of intensity might help us understand what it is that happened in their life that causes them to respond in such a way. And so here's the encouragement this morning to each of you as, as we seek to understand, that, understand this. There was a time in Paul's life where he did not think like this. Do you guys recognize that? We so often read Paul and we're like, wow, Paul, he's got it together. Where is he getting this stuff? Paul used to not think like this at all. That's pretty cool, isn't it? He didn't think like this. There was a Paul when he was actually diametrically opposed to all of this stuff that he's writing about. I, I think that that's just so encouraging. He was so opposed to the good news about Jesus where he himself actually had a habit of making Christians suffer. And yet now he's talking about his own suffering on behalf of Christ for the church. Isn't that beautiful? What changed in him? Something changed. That should be an encouragement to us this morning because it means that wherever you're at this morning, I don't care where you're at. You know why? Because wherever you're at, you can grow. You can become more like Christ. If Paul can do it, if Jesus can do that in Paul's life, he can do it in your life as well. We, we all start from this place of opposition to Christ at some point in time, and we're all faced with that temptation to be in that place on a daily basis. In fact, it's what's called home base for all of us. It's, it's what Paul would call life in the flesh. It's what this morning I'm going to call normal life. I know that doesn't sound very fancy, but it's the simplest way I can say it. It's just normal life. And we all live in that normal life zone from time to time, maybe more often than we'd like to admit, we all can, if we've been following Jesus for a long time and our life has changed radically, you could probably remember what normal life looked like before you started following him. It's defined by your accomplishments, by degrees, external validations. All this stuff is good, by the way. None of it's bad, necessarily. It, it's defined by money, by power, by relationships, by fame, by success. It's okay. It's all just stuff, right? It's all external stuff. But it's defined by an unceasing and overwhelming fixation on self-preservation. It's pretty much just about me at all costs, right? And when we find ourselves living in that kind of default place, normal life on our own terms, we find ourselves asking this question a lot of people and of God. We'll ask the question like, do you love me? Like we're doing stuff, but really underneath all the stuff we're doing, there's a hidden question. Like, am I good enough yet? Do you love me? 
Yeah, and, and God's response is the same, no matter who we are. He, he just says, I love you. I've always loved you. I, I don't necessarily love the stuff, but I love you. And, and other people's response to us might be something like, I'll love you if it benefits me. Because they're playing the same game. They're, they're seeking love. They're seeking affirm, affirmation through their actions as well, right? And so we believe that our ability to be loved, it's like the stock market. It's like up one day, oh, we messed up, I guess I'm unlovable. Or like, like it might be even up and down over the course of a day, right? That's like how it is so often in this kind of life. And this kind of life is really tricky because it's not just defining of people who we traditionally think as like, that's a bad person. No, this is talking about like good, normal, everyday people like you and me. And for Paul, he lived out of this place for so many years that he actually thought that he was doing God a favor with everything he did, with all of his actions. In fact, you might know that you're living a normal life in the flesh if you either continually feel like you're a failure before God or like God should be happy that he has you on his team. If you feel that way, that might be a good sign that, man, I'm just kind of living a normal life. Like, because either you're going to be flogged with shame about everything you've done or you're going to be totally delusional about your abilities, right? But either way, it's, it's a totally foreign concept to what it means to actually follow Jesus. And it's going to cause you to read Colossians 1.24 like it's totally foreign and ridiculous. You'd be like, how could you be happy in suffering? Because life is defined by all the stuff that we accomplish. A person in the flesh would never be thriving or rejoicing in a prison cell on behalf of other people. So here's the question. What changed in Paul? What changed in him? Well, I'm going to use a real old-fashioned word. Something called conversion happened in his life. Conversion, it's an old word. We don't like to use it anymore. Uh, but it's the only way that Paul could say what he says here. It's the only way his attitude could change. Here's what confer conversion is defined as. It's the process of changing or causing something to change from one form to another. A and how do we change from one form to another? I'm going to use another old word. By repenting. By repenting, by starting to think differently. Now, conversion is born of repentance. Repentance is what John the Baptist, back in the Gospels before Jesus came, it's what he talked about all the time. It's doing a 180-degree turn, not, not just in your lifestyle, but in your thinking specifically. It's supposed to be radical. It's supposed to be startling. In fact, I'm just going to do this for a second just to prove it. If I were to preach like this, I'd do a 180-degree turn, people would think I'm like in love with the wall or like I really like looking at my own slides. It would be a very radical, a very odd, strange thing to do. Everybody would look at you and be like, what are you doing? And that's what repentance is, right? That's what repentance is. Repentance is so radical. It changes things by a total 180 that people see you and they're like, what happened to you? And that's what happens in conversion. When you're converted, it's something that only God can, can do. It's not like you can wake up and be like, all right, I want to be converted. That's it. I'm doing it. I mean, it's great. If you have that mentality, awesome. You should. That's a great mentality. But, but really, it's something that God is going to have to do in your life. You're going to have to seek him out. Like if I tried to muscle my way and, and thinking about running across the United States solo, I, I don't think I could ever get there. Because God would have to change my thinking. He'd have to change my priorities about what's most important in my life. And conversion, conversion is God's work in our lives to change from old to new. So you may know that you are going through a conversion to following Jesus because you're going to start noticing some stuff about yourself. You'll notice that you no longer believe that you are defined by what you accomplish anymore. That's going to become less important. But now you are defined by what God has proclaimed to be true about you. Things like that you are loved. Deep down, you're going to know, man, I just, I know that I'm loved by God. That you're cherished by him. That you're an image bearer of his. That you are wonderfully made. In other words, life is going to stop being so much about what you are accomplishing, and it's going to be about what he has accomplished on your behalf. Uh, you're not going to be uh, weighed down by shame anymore. 
the shame in your life is going to start to fall away slowly as you realize that your life's not defined by the mistakes of your past anymore. And then, friends, might I suggest you are being converted into seeing the world in a completely new way. Like Paul, you are going to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? It's so beautiful. Remember who Paul was. He was the guy who was murdering Christians. You remember that? That's this story in the book of Acts. He was the one who was standing there murdering Christians, yet he doesn't talk like somebody who was like that, does he? He talks with boldness. He talks like he's been given a mission from God to make clear what the gospel actually is. Here's what it says in verse 25. He says, listen to this language. He says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Paul the murderer is saying that. Shouldn't he be under like some rock ashamed of himself? Wouldn't you be? I think I would be really tempted to never show my face again. I mean, you think about Moses in the Old Testament. That's what he did. He ran away for 40 years. And yet here's Paul, the chosen one of God, ready and willing to do anything that God asks of him. Does this help you make more sense of how he could be totally fine with suffering? It's because he's been bought at a price by Jesus. His life is completely different now. And, and now hearing his voice, doing his will, doing Jesus' will is the thing he wants to do because Jesus is the one who set him free from a totally different life. So now as we're converted, as these things, as this radical change in our life happens, we might ask that same question that we had before. We might still ask the question like, who loves me now that I'm different? And God's response would be the exact same. He'd say, I've always loved you. I've always loved you. And I love that you can finally start to see that I've always loved you. And simultaneously, we might hear from others like a response that's like, who are you? Like, you've changed. And some of us in this room, we have that story. I've talked to enough of you where it's like, when I started following Jesus, people started being like, what changed about you? Something changed about you. We see this happening with Paul. All of the people he spent time with, his whole life circle, it, it was built around this persona that he had made that was totally divorced from God. I mean, it looked godly on the outside, but it was actually just a facade and so as a result of his conversion, he became friendless for a time. He became friendless. I mean, his old friends no longer wanted to be with him. And the Christians, well, he had just been killing the Christians. They didn't want anything to do with him. And so this guy, Paul, all of a sudden, something radical has changed about him. But all of a sudden, he's in this lonely place where God has changed me. And yet, it's kind of lonely. And friends, if you find that you are in a season of conversion where God is complete, completely turning something in your life upside down, causing you to see who he is in a different way, and if you're finding that to be a very lonely process, here's what I want to say to you. Don't give up. Don't give up in that moment. God might be doing something huge in your life at this very moment, and, and honestly, you might be feeling like you're completely disoriented, but it's exactly where you might need to just sit for a period of time. And I think this is because we become so accustomed to receiving affirmation from our old way of life, don't we? We have so many years of getting affirmation for all of the stuff that I do, from all of the people around me, that God oftentimes simply just needs to remove us from those old spaces and those old places and those old situations so that, so that we can be rewired so that we can learn to trust his voice, so that we can do something new for him. And I want you to hear what Paul says next. Here's what he says in verses 26 and 27. He says, this is just crazy stuff. He says, the mystery, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, here's my question. How did Paul come up with this stuff? How did he come up with this stuff? Because when he talks about the mystery here, 
he is not talking about something spooky or supernatural. That's like what we think of when we think about a mystery. In Paul's day, this is actually language that they would have used to talk about what we might think of as like the sacred center of his religion. So uh, the philosophers in Colossae in his day, they would literally use this same terminology to reinforce secret knowledge that you could get if you kept going up these spiritual levels to get closer and closer to divine knowledge. For Paul, it was completely different. It didn't have to do with these secret spiritual things. It had to do with Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected, and his presence in you. And it was this, this mystery that Paul wanted them to know. He said that it's not only that God is interested in sending like messengers like he did in the Old Testament to testify himself, but the mystery is the fact that God himself would be made human and become in the flesh and live this life and die and be resurrected for you. For you. And not only that, it's not only for like spiritual insiders. It's not for people who have been like following him for a really long time. It's not just for an ethnic group. It's for everyone, Paul says. It's for you. You think it's for someone else, but it's not just for them. It's for you. And not only is it for you and for everyone sitting next to you, for the person on the street or down the block, for the person around the world, here is the mystery of what Paul is pointing to, this sacred center that he wants people to grab onto. What is it all about? It's Christ in you. He's in you, and not just you as an individual. Look around. It's always about us, the community. It's in all of you. It's in us. Christ is in us corporately. You remember a couple weeks ago, Christ holds it all together? He's the one who fills everything up as well. And so Paul is telling us what this mystery is that he wants them to understand, that Christ is in you which, which means that no longer do you need to get, go to some like physical location to meet with Jesus. No longer do you need some specific spiritual exercise to hear him or know him, even though spiritual exercises can be really beneficial too. He just wants you to know this one thing, that Christ is in you, that you carry him with you wherever you go. Uh, for me, I am a Fort Wilderness kid. For those of you who don't know Fort, it's just a camp up in northern Wisconsin. I grew up going there all the time. My parents were actually here this morning, which I wasn't expecting, so I'm going to share a really embarrassing story about myself. Uh, At Fort Wilderness, uh, one time we were up there, I think I was like 10 or 11, and (laughs) we were up there for a really long time. And I remember we were leaving, and the last day I would always cry. I would just cry (laughs) before, because I didn't want to leave Fort, because Fort was the place where I like met with God and met with people, and it was so, you could, it just was so, like, it was happening. Like, it was so clear there. And so I remember one time turning to my mom as we were in the car leaving, and I was crying. I was a kid, and I said, Mom, I just want to die here someday. (laughs) And and that's my experience with Fort. So, okay, embarrassing. Let's get even more embarrassing then. So then last fall, I was up at men's retreat, and some of you guys were there too. And I was having, I still, every time I go to Fort, I have the same feelings. I'm like, I don't want to leave. (laughs) I just don't want to leave. Like, I love my life back at home. Everything's great. There's no problems. But like here, I can just experience the presence of God in some sort of a different way. So instead of turning right to go home out of of forts, out of that street, I turned left. And I went to a property that they own called Blair Lake. And I was hiking around the lake. And I was just experiencing having this last moment by myself. Nobody was there with God. And I was just, his presence was just palpable to me. And at one point, he just put me on my knees. And I was crying, again, 35 years old. It's ridiculous. I was crying. And, and, but I got this sense from God that it, that it was like, you can leave and it'll be okay. Because it's not about Fort. It's not about the place that you go to. The, the real reality was that he wanted me to know that Christ goes with me that I take him with me wherever I go, that I couldn't go anywhere without him anymore. I experienced in one small way this deep mystery that was like, oh, Christ is in me. Like, I knew that, but I didn't know it, know it. You know, like it was, it went down a level deeper and it filled me with what Paul calls that hope of glory. So I'm going to just ask again, how did Paul figure all this stuff out? Like, how did he come to know this? How did an ex-murderer, Jesus-hating person, come to know about these mysteries that have been kept hidden for generations. 
He came to know these things because he went through this process of conversion, and it wasn't enough to simply be converted. We always think, like, that's your moment, your conversion moment. It's an important moment. But it wasn't enough to just do that. He opened himself up to what God does next with us, and that is to a time of preparation. And, you know, most of us think that Paul just woke up and had all of this great information that he was going to write down in letters for us so that we could, could read. But the real reality, you can read about this in the book of Galatians, is that Paul spent three years in the desert alone after this happened. He spent three years in Arabia, and following that, he spent some amount of time in Jerusalem learning and debating with the church leaders of his day, with, with Peter and with James. Uh, and perhaps he went elsewhere. He grew in his knowledge. He was already really smart, but he grew in relationship with Jesus and with the church. And some scholars think that it might have taken him up to a decade of preparation time after his conversion, before he began spreading the news about Jesus in his travels. And so you might know this morning that you're in a time of preparation right now because you find yourself drawn to different things now. You find yourself drawn to prayer. You might find yourself drawn to listening more than talking. You might find yourself drawn to releasing control of your plans for your life, of learning to hear God's voice over your own voice or anybody else's voice. In other words, this time of preparation, is, it's defined not by external validation, but it's really defined by God validating you. It's by God's validation alone. So you might start finding yourself uh, caring a whole lot less about what other people think about you. You find that you're just not being validated in that way anymore. You, you might find yourself turning off your social media for a certain period of time or, or getting yourself away from distractions for a certain period of time as you learn, as you really want to yearn to hear God's voice over all other things. In fact, we have this thing, you'll hear Brian talk about this sometimes, talks about Kairos, about this Kairos tool, which is a tool that we've practiced with some groups around here, which really just helps us learn how to listen to what God is doing in our lives. The Kairos group that we ran this last week with just a small group from Meadowbrook was very odd to me. It was, it was a very odd Bible study because we we did not tell each other answers about what we think people should do in their lives. We actually just asked them to listen to God, then to go home, live your week listening to God. What is God doing in your life? And to come back and we ask questions instead of giving answers. We say, okay, I wonder if God is saying this in your life, or I wonder if he's pointing you in this direction. It's a completely different way of experiencing God. And so the question, it goes so hand in hand with that preparation period. The question you might start asking now when you're in a season of preparation, instead of, do you love me? It might be, what's next? What's next? And God's response might be something like this. Well, just listen. Wait. Wait and see what I have planned for you. Other people might respond by saying, like, we have no idea what's gotten into you. You're talking to God all of a sudden. But the strange thing about this period is that we might feel like we just came off of this conversion experience that's like super high, and we're ready to go, and we find ourselves in this time all of a sudden of preparation. And our temptation is to feel like it's a major letdown, like, I'm ready to go. And God might be saying, I, I know you're ready to go, and that's great, but I also want to prepare you for something big that I have planned for you, too. And for Paul, he came away with knowledge about Jesus, about the kingdom of God that is simply undoubtedly God-inspired and God-breathed. How else could he have discovered this revelation of Christ in you? It's the center of what we believe. And here's the good news about if we stick with God through this time of preparation, that he will lead each and every one of us into a specific mission. He will lead you into a specific mission. It's what Paul generally calls life by the Spirit, although life by the Spirit is definitely a part of the conversion and the preparation too. But it's this life where we recognize Christ's presence is in us. And, and we listen to him and we consistently learn to respond to him. And each of us who follow Jesus is invited into that new creation kind of lifestyle. But for each one of us, it's going to look like something a little bit different. It's going to look specific to you. Here's what Paul says in verses 28 and 29 about his mission. He says, He is the one we proclaim, 
admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Just hear those words. He's saying, I, to this end, I strenuously contend with all of the energy that God's given me. When we stick with God, we practice listening. We practice hearing often enough. We wait upon what it is he's saying in your life, in each of our lives. We're going to come away eventually with a mission that is given from God. Isn't that what each of us wants? Isn't that what you want, to have that kind of clarity that God has given you that mission? For Paul, it was proclaiming the gospel. Why? So that you might become a mature person. You might become a mature follower of Jesus so that you might become a person who is no longer defined by what others think of you, by external validations, or by your friends, or by what your spouse thinks of you, or your coworkers, or whoever. Paul wants you to become a person who is rock solid, like unshakable, a person who has been tested, who's been transformed by the Spirit of God, who's painfully waited in the silence of prayer with a heart that wants God more than anything else. He wants to transform us into somebody like that so that you might arrive at a place where you know with everything what it is that he has specifically called you for. And when you're there, you'll find yourself in this kind of strange dichotomy, this strange dynamic. You're simultaneously going to be calm. You'll be resting in who Jesus is and what he says about you. And at the same time, you're going to, what happened to Paul is going to happen to you as well. It's going to set you on fire. It, you're going to be relentless for, for the mission that he's given you. You're going to have a passion to do whatever it is that he says because you love him now. You don't love all the stuff around you. You love him alone. Your desires have been changed. You've been converted. They're no longer for all the stuff of the world, but they're for him. They're for him alone. And that's why Paul says that his job is to proclaim and teach everyone. He wants everybody to experience that good news. And he does it strenuously with all of his energy. What do you do strenuously? You know, so you think, you might think you've arrived at this place of mission because you start to ask a different question. You ask this question of, how can I be as faithful as possible to the call of God in my life? If you're asking that question a lot, it's a pretty good sign that you are in a place where you feel like you are on mission. Like, okay, God, I know what you've called me to. Now, how can I be as faithful as possible? And God's response will be just stay connected to me. Stay connected to me and I'll show you. And other people, they might say, we don't even know what you're talking about. I'm sorry. This is so far off the map. So we can see this process at work in Paul's life with this movement from normal life to conversion, a time of preparation, and then a mission or life by the Spirit. So here's the question this morning. Where do you find yourself? When you look at that, where, where do you find yourself? I mean, are you maturing? Are you changing? What does the story of your life, the past several years, say about what's going on inside of you? Like, do you look more like Jesus today than you did a year ago? Uh, like, have you learned to hear his voice more? Are you intentional with him? And, and if not, why not? What, what would be more important than that? Jesus says there's nothing more important than your soul. That word soul just means your very core inner self, who you really are. He says there's nothing more important than that, than your life with God. So how does it look? Because here's the reality. When I look at each of you, I have no idea. I can't know what's going on inside of you. Even when you look at me up here, you, you, you don't know, right? You don't really know what's going on inside of us because sometimes we look great on the outside, but we're wasting away on the inside. And so here's my encouragement today as we end. Maybe this is a moment of reflection for you during this last song and during this time of prayer. But I would say, like, do it more properly. Take some time this afternoon and just do a self-inventory. Like, where am I in this process of following Jesus? And I just want you to know that here at Meadowbrook, wherever you are on this process, it's simply the truth about you, and it's totally great that that's exactly where you are. 
If you find yourself not even on the map, just doing normal life, it's not even registering what I'm talking about this morning. You want to know something? You are more than welcome here to come and find out who Jesus is and to come and follow us. And that's the invitation for you this morning, is to follow him. Because being like Jesus means that everything in your life will change. But it is the best kind of change. It's the kind of change that you deeply, deeply want. So let's pray about that. Would you pray with me? Lord, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the Bible. I'm grateful for friends, people who encourage us. I'm grateful for family, for fun stuff that we get to do, just for stuff that we look forward to. But God, I'm actually just thankful for you because you're the one who is behind it all. You're the one that we really want. My prayer for each of us this morning is that you might give us some clarity of thought. You might give us the ability to look at ourselves, to see what it is we really love, to be able to walk towards you. My prayer is that wherever we find ourselves this morning, Lord, that we would be taking the next step towards you. I'm praying for every single person here this morning that says, yeah, this is great, but I have no idea what to do next. God, I pray that you would just minister to them right now. You'd give us a clear idea of just this is the next thing to do. We love you so much, Lord. We know your spirit's at work within us, and we invite that work. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.